Today's video is kindly brought to you by Way. Go to theway.com and use code Kendall to get 15% off your entire purchase. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So happy to have you here with me for another video. And if you are new, welcome. So as you can probably tell, I am in a new filming location. This is where I will be filming my videos for the next couple of months. I've got kind of a temporary setup going in my living room here while I am getting close to giving birth and for when I am kind of coming back after I have the baby because it's very close to her nursery. It's comfortable. It's going to be kind of a pain to be, you know, setting up all the lighting and camera and mic and everything every time I record. But for now, it's going to work. If you didn't catch my last video, I am quite pregnant now. Friends, I am 35 weeks when you're seeing this. And so baby can really come at any time. And I don't know how much longer I will be posting. That's kind of up in the air. I could be here for a couple more weeks. I could be here for one more week. I could, this could be my last one. We just don't know. It's kind of crazy. You know, she is calling the shots now. So I just got to go with her timing. I did mention in my last upload that I have, I've pre-recorded one video. I hope to be able to get one more done before baby comes so that you guys have at least two videos that I've pre-recorded for when I'm on leave. I don't know how long I'm gonna be on leave yet. I don't know what that's gonna look like. Again, that all depends on her, how birth goes, how she is as a newborn, and just what my life looks like. Obviously, this is my first rodeo, and so I just, don't really know what to expect. So I want to thank you guys in advance for all the kind comments and for being patient with me during this very exciting time in my life. And again, I am posting an occasional vlog here or there to document my experience with pregnancy. And if you have not seen any of those, I will have my vlog channel linked below. Also, before we get started today, I wanted to remind you about the charity merch that I am running for National Center for Missing and Exploited Children right now. Thank you so much to everyone who has purchased an item from the collection. I was blown away with our first you know, week or two of orders. We definitely did a lot. <laughs> they are still available. We actually just restocked everything. So if you would like to get your hands on some of our neck neck merch, it's available at milehiremerch.com in the Kendall Ray section. And 100% of the proceeds will be donated to National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. I love how the design turned out and it's a great organization. So it's really a win-win for you. You get a give back and you also get a really cute shirt or crew neck in the process. But anyway, for today's case, we are going to be talking about Lorenzen Wright. He was a very talented NBA player who played 13 seasons, actually. And he played for several different teams, the Clippers, the Hawks, the Grizzlies, the Kings, and the Cavaliers. And he was tragically murdered in 2010. And the most recent trial for the case actually just wrapped up. And it started in March of 2022. So I wanted to cover it today. I know it's been in headlines kind of recently. And let's go ahead and start by talking more about Lorenzen's life. Lorenzen was born on November 4th, 1975 in Oxford, Mississippi. And before he was known for his 13 seasons in the NBA, he got his start in basketball at Lafayette High School, where he played for three years. During his senior year, he moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and he played for Booker T. Washington High School. And he loved Memphis. Particularly, he liked the music scene, the churches, and the fact that he could always find good barbecue there. And high school was a very exciting time for him. I mean, he was the star of the basketball team. He had a great social life. And he actually ended up meeting the daughter of one of his coaches. And at first, they were just friends. She was actually five years older than him, so she was in college when they first met. And eventually when Lorenzen went to college, their friendship turned into a relationship. Lorenzen played at the University of Memphis, where he was also a member of the Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. And by his sophomore year of college, he was already playing on an All-American team, which is a team that's made up of players who are voted the best in the country by a group of organizations. And he was super, super talented. Even people who didn't really like watching basketball would make a point to watch Lorenzen because he was that good. And it wasn't long after he played in college that he realized he had the talent that it would take to possibly play in the NBA, which of course 
would be a dream for him. And he told his mom that he was interested in eventually getting into the NBA. And she was a little hesitant. She really wanted him to focus on his degree. Before it was time to graduate, I told him, nope, you can't go to no NBA. Well, you, you gotta go to get your degree. And he said, mama, where am I gonna get a million dollars with a degree for a drama job? And y'all know I thought about 10 minutes and I said, when you say you're leaving? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm serious, cause I couldn't so give no answer. You lost that argument quick. Yes, I did. But he would joke with his mom and say that a million dollar salary playing in the NBA would be much better than any degree. Now, Lorenzen was very close with his mom. He was also very close with his dad, even though the two of them were divorced. He loved both of his parents and really had a strong sense of family from a young age. His father, Herb, had actually been through a lot himself. He was left paralyzed after being shot in the back while on duty working for the Memphis Parks Department. But even though he was in a wheelchair, he still showed up for everything that he could for his son. He was a huge supporter for him in his basketball career. And it wasn't long before Lorenzen became a father himself. His son was born April 11th, 1995, and Lorenzen was actually a freshman in college at the time. And his first son was named Lorenzen Wright Jr. Shara was the mother of his child, and the two of them actually went on to have five more kids. Now, having a family was very important to Lorenzen. I mean, he was so close with both of his parents. He knew he wanted to have a lot of children and have good relationships with them. However, a lot of people in his life at the time felt that Shara was kind of trying to trap him with children. They felt like, you know, she knew her boyfriend was going to make it big, possibly be in the NBA, and that having kids with him would solidify her being part of that picture. And of course, this is just how his friends and family felt. The two of them got married on June 6th, 1998, and the early days of their marriage were happy as far as we know, especially now that Lorenzen ended up in the NBA, and he was making a lot of money. He was actually drafted into the NBA in 1996, so two years before they got married, and he signed with the Los Angeles Clippers after being the seventh overall pick in the first round. The commissioner is ready, as you with see. With the seventh pick, in the 1996 NBA draft, the Los Angeles Clippers select Lorenzen Wright from the University of Memphis. Lorenzen would also go on to play center for the Atlanta Hawks, the Memphis Grizzlies, Sacramento Kings, and lastly, the Cleveland Cavaliers. And when he was traded to the Grizzlies in 2001, that was kind of the high point of his career. Getting to play for Memphis was a dream for him. I mean, he was getting to play for his home team. From high school to college to the NBA now, Lorenzen had played all three levels in the place where he grew up, and that meant a lot to him. But regardless of what team he was playing for, he always loved and respected his other teammates. Everyone who played with him had nothing but good things to say about him, that he was a good teammate, he was friendly, he was always in high spirits and extremely easygoing. That's one way that a lot of people describe Lorenzen, that he was just a very go with the flow type of dude. And Lorenzen was always known as being a very kind and generous person from a young age before he had money. He was always giving to other people. But once he started making millions in the NBA, he really started giving to people. He even purchased a home for his mother. And it was just a few miles down the road from the house that he owned in Tennessee. And he was definitely that type of person that would give the shirt off his back. He would always help friends. He would pay for everything from dinners to travel expenses, getting them to his games, even college tuition on multiple occasions for different friends. He would let friends stay in his home, which a lot of people described as being better than Disneyland. And he definitely enjoyed the finer things in life, especially cars. Lorenzen loved cars and Shara loved jewelry. So even though the two of them had millions coming in, Millions were going out as well. So throughout his NBA career, Lorenzen played nearly 800 games over 13 different seasons. And during the course of his career, his family was growing. After the birth of their son in 1995, Lorenzen and Shara had a daughter named Lauren, and then twins named Lamar and Shamar, and then another daughter named Sophia, and lastly, a son named Lawson. Now, 
they also had a baby girl named Sierra and she was born on March 14th, 2002. But sadly, she actually passed due to SIDS when she was only 11 months old, which as you can imagine, was incredibly heartbreaking for the two of them. Lorenzen was extremely distraught. People around him said that this affected him just a horrific way. And he ended up creating the Sierra Simone Wright Scholarship Fund in her honor. And he even became inspired to return to college himself and finish up his degree in summer of 2003. But the devastation of losing their daughter really took a toll on both of them and took a toll on their marriage. But around this time, things for his career were really looking up. However, that didn't last long either because in the 2008 to 2009 NBA season, he wasn't offered another contract. He was a good player. He was steady for 13 seasons straight, but his performance just no longer made the cut. The competition was too good. And not only was his NBA career now over, but so was his marriage with Shara. The two of them ended up getting divorced in February of 2010. Shara was the one who actually filed the papers, but Lorenzen agreed that their marriage was over. It seems like losing Sierra was one of the things that led to the downfall of their marriage, but they also were both unfaithful to each other. And Lorenzo did tell some of his friends and family that he felt like Shara was only in the marriage for the money, especially towards the end. And during their divorce proceedings, Lorenzo ended up signing a $1 million life insurance policy. And it stated that if anything happened to him, this money would go to his six kids. And he was also ordered to pay Shara $26,000 a month in child support and alimony, which is quite a bit. Given how much money he had made throughout his career, it shouldn't have been that hard for him, but like I said, he was spending and giving a lot and Shara was spending a lot. So it soon became difficult for him to keep up with those payments. After the divorce, Lorenzen ended up moving to Atlanta, but he would frequently visit his kids back in Memphis. However, things didn't fully end with Shara, even though they were now divorced. They actually continued to hook up and friends said that they were actually considering getting back together. There's not too much detail about that available, but during this time, money was getting tighter and tighter, even though it was estimated that Lorenzen made at least $55 million in his NBA career. It was so bad, in fact, that the bank was about to repossess his condo in Atlanta and it wouldn't stop there. Lorenzen did have loose plans to play basketball overseas so that he could make some money and better support his kids. But those who were close to him at the time said that he mentioned feeling kind of lost. So Lorenzen had been doing some traveling in 2010, and at one point he had plans to travel from Atlanta to Memphis. This was a normal type of trip for him. I mean, he was just going to go back and see his kids. There were a couple specific reasons he was going back. This time his daughter was having having a dance recital that he wanted to be at and Shara wanted him to be at. And his sister was also having a baby shower. So on July 18th, 2010, Lorenzen was driven to the Atlanta airport by a close friend. And when he landed in Memphis, he first spent the day driving around with another close friend. This friend said that the two of them ended up parting ways for the night because Shara had called him and was very upset that he wasn't home yet. So the next day, is the baby shower. And he has plans to see a ton of friends and family. Everyone's expecting him to come, but he doesn't show up. Most of his friends and his father, who were expecting to see him that day, figured that he wasn't in any type of danger, that he just decided to, you know, take a trip somewhere else or was off with friends doing who knows what. I mean, he kind of lived that NBA player life and they felt like it wasn't totally out of the norm for him to kind of disappear, especially with everything that he had been going through lately. He had been dealing with a lot mentally, but his mother right away felt very concerned. She felt like it was not like him to just blow off his sister's baby shower and to not tell anyone where he was. So she spent the whole day trying to reach him, but had no luck. And Deborah just knew that something was wrong. So on July 22nd, 
Deborah reported Lorenzen missing. Obviously, the first step for police is to speak with his friends and family, try to get an idea of where he might be. And of course, police also talked to Shara. And when they did, she had quite a story for them. She explained that Lorenzen showed up at her house on the night of July 18th. And that when he did, he had a burner phone with him. And according to her, he told whoever was on the other line on this burner phone that he was going to, quote, flip something. And then she claims that around 10.30 p.m., he left her house with $100,000 in cash and a box of drugs, which she later changes her story about this box of drugs. She ends up saying that she never said anything about a box of drugs, that somebody made this up. But when she talked to police about his disappearance, she said that a few weeks prior to him leaving the house on July 18th, three men came to her house with guns looking for Lorenzen. And she said that these men threatened her, so she didn't report it to police because she feared for her safety and for her children's safety. So based on what she's telling the police, they start to believe that maybe he was involved in something sketchy. So the search for Lorenzen went on for 10 days, and this was a very hard time for his friends, for his family, especially his mother, Deborah. She was just devastated and knew that something bad had happened. And it actually wasn't until July 28th, 2010, 10 days after he disappeared, that his body was found. The search for a missing former NBA star has come to a tragic end. Police found a male body in a wooded area in Memphis, Tennessee yesterday, and they say it is Lorenzen Wright. His body was found in a wooded area off of Callis Cutoff Road. And when he was finally found, his body was in bad shape. He was badly decomposed, especially with it being July in Tennessee. I mean, it is hot out there, just horrible conditions. And his body actually only weighed 57 pounds at this point, was pretty much unrecognizable. He was only 34 years old. This is a great loss for the city of Memphis for his family. Uh, such an early age. I mean, it's just senseless, you know, to, you know, this, how, this isn't how you want it to end, being found in a field somewhere and for what? I mean, it's just it's stupid. It's just, it's just a hurtful feeling that you have and you just wish his family the best. And it turns out that he had been shot a total of five times in the chest, in the skull, and in the right forearm. And because of all the damage that the sun really did to his body, investigators felt like it was going to be really hard to uncover evidence in this case. And what's so unbelievably frustrating about this case is that it turns out he could have been found much, much sooner. Because Lorenzen had actually called police on July 19th, right before he was murdered. And this 911 call has been released. However, I don't think I'm gonna be able to include it in this video. YouTube is very picky about 911 calls, and I know for some of you, it might be very upsetting to hear. So I'm just going to link it below so that you can have a listen for yourself if you want to. But basically, you really don't hear much. It almost immediately starts out with 11 gunshots. And other than that, it's just really silent. The dispatcher who answered the call was located in Germantown, Tennessee, which is just a few miles east of Memphis. Germantown is also less than 10 miles from Collierville, which is the town that Lorenzen's family lived and also where his body was found. And this is important to note because the dispatcher who got the call did not report it did not report it to the police, did not make note of it, even though they had received a call where clearly something terrible is happening. There's 11 gunshots going off and the caller is silent. And the reason that they say they didn't report this call is because the location technology placed the caller outside of their jurisdiction, which is just an excuse in my opinion, because if they did report it, it's likely that the police could have better traced that call and found Lorenzen before his killer or killers had the opportunity to clean up the crime scene. And if they had gotten to his body sooner, there could have been a lot more evidence. At the crime scene, they were able to find two bullet casings from two different weapons, which is why they were led to believe that there was more than one killer. But because the 911 call wasn't reported until July 27th, 
it took until July 28th for them to actually find his body. And by that point, all they had to go on was a very badly decomposed body and the notion, mainly from Shara, that Lorenzen had been involved in some shady activity, possibly some type of illegal drug activity. And they said that given the fact he seemed to be in a bad financial situation and you know that accompanied with everything Shara was telling them, they felt like that wasn't out of the realm of possibility. So one theory that police initially had was that Lorenzen's murder could be possibly connected to this guy named Bobby Cole. Bobby was known to have a connection to the Mexican drug cartel and his relationship with Lorenzen was actually investigated previously by the DEA. Like I mentioned earlier, Lorenzen really liked cars. If there was anything that his money was going to the most, It was cars, expensive cars. And when his money started to run out, he started selling those cars. And Bobby also had a thing for cars and he purchased two luxury cars from Lorenzen. But interestingly enough, the cars were still registered in Lorenzen's name when they were found to be involved in the moving of drugs. And Lorenzen denied any connection to the cartel or knowledge of what was being done with the cars once he sold them to Bobby. And the DEA did end up finding that Lorenzen was not involved. But now it was something to consider because of everything that Shara was saying and the circumstances of his murder. However, from the beginning, Lorenzen's friends were not convinced. A few of his closest friends felt that he would have mentioned being involved with the drug cartel to them, or at least mentioned it if shady people were after him. Police also had another theory to investigate. In early August of 2010, one of Cher's neighbors came forward saying that around the time of Lorenzen's disappearance, they noticed that she was with an unknown male in her backyard and that they were using the fire pit. And what was incredibly odd about this is It was July in Tennessee. Not only that, it was a particularly hot summer and no one in their right mind would be setting up a fire pit. So based on this tip, investigators received a search warrant and on August 10th, they searched her home. And in the fire pit, they found a few pieces of burnt metal, which ended up being paper clips and some other kind of office supplies. And if they did find anything else that pointed to her being a potential suspect, they didn't share that information at the time. So time passed without any real solid leads and more and more people were starting to point the finger at Shara. That $1 million life insurance policy was awarded to his children. However, none of them were old enough to control it. So Shara controlled it. And she was supposed to obviously use this money for her children. However, Lorenzen's father noticed that she was not using it on the children. It turns out that within 10 months of getting that life insurance policy, within 10 months of his murder, she had spent almost all of it. She bought a new house, new furniture, new cars, and other things, and claimed that all of it was for her children, that it was for a better life for them, that it would give them a safer environment. And so Lorenzen's father ended up suing Shara on behalf of his grandkids. And a Tennessee judge did end up resolving that issue. And a trust was set up to benefit the kids with the remaining money and money from his other assets. Although Shara would still be the trustee on this account, and she was supposed to keep the court up to date on how she was using the money. And she didn't like that. She didn't like having to keep them updated. So she petitioned the court and she also asked for more money. She said she was owed that because Lorenzen had fallen behind on his alimony payments, but the judge ended up denying her petition. And by this point, as for the investigation, things started to kind of dry up. So in 2011, they put up a reward for information. It was $21,000 and only 48 tips came in, which isn't a whole lot. And only about half of them were even worth investigating. And so time went by, eventually years passed. And the hope for finding Lorenzen's killer was starting to fade. Many people, you know, in his personal life, as well as the public still felt like Shara was somehow involved. But please, you know, really couldn't do anything because there was no evidence. And that all changed in 2015. That year, Shara ended up releasing a book. It was titled Mr. Tell Me Everything. And this book was about the life of a woman who was married to an unfaithful and abusive NBA player. And she at first claimed that the story was fiction, but 
the details in the book led many to believe otherwise. And eventually, she just began straight up telling people that the main character was based on Lorenzen. As you can imagine, this book stirred up a lot of controversy. That same year, she did an interview with Sports Illustrated that only you know, heightened the belief that she may know more than she was letting on. She was straight up asked if she had anything to do with her husband's murder. And she was very offended by even being asked this question. And here is her response. Do you have anything to do with his murder or his disappearance? I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm an author, and the police should find his killer. For my name to be even in the same sentence or something like that, I'm a minister of the Lord. I've never been in any type of trouble or anything. I, I just, I, I'm a mother, an author, and a wife. So, obviously, with this statement, she doesn't deny involvement. Eventually, Shara became a minister, and she also got remarried. So it seemed like she was, you know, moving on with her life. And this was very frustrating for his friends and family that felt that there was more that she just was not telling police. So the case had been pretty much cold for a while and that all changed on November 9th, 2017 when FBI divers uncovered the murder weapon in a lake in Mississippi. And they ended up finding this gun based on a conversation with a man named Jimmy Martin. So turns out Jimmy Martin was Shara's cousin. And in 2017, he was facing criminal charges for the murder of his girlfriend. And during all of that, he ended up telling the police the truth about the murder of Lorenzen. He told police that he was not there the night that Lorenzen was shot, but he could tell them who was responsible. According to him, the murder was committed by Shara Wright and a man named Billy Ray Turner. He claimed he knew this because Shara not only asked him for help, but brought him to the crime scene after the murder to help clean up. And he also said that he was with Billy when he ditched the murder weapon in the lake. And he also told police that the night that Lorenzen was killed was not the first time that they attempted to murder him. Jimmy and Billy had previously tried and had been unsuccessful. But the time that Billy was successful, he wasn't with Jimmy, he was with Shara. So this Billy Ray Turner guy, actually was Shara's landscaper. And there has been some question about whether or not the two of them possibly could have been romantically involved. But now, Billy was definitely tied to this murder based on Jimmy's word and the fact that the murder weapon was exactly where Jimmy said it would be. And not so surprisingly, Shara did not show any type of emotion when she was told that the murder weapon was found. She didn't seem relieved or happy in any way that maybe this would lead to finding the killer of her ex-husband. Instead, she seemed extremely worried. So on December 5th, 2017, not long after the gun was found, Billy was arrested and indicted on three different criminal charges. And 10 days after that, Shara was arrested in California. So when it was time for the arraignment of Billy Ray Turner, Deborah actually had an emotional outburst in court. I jumped up and I asked him, how could you have murdered my son? And she was reprimanded for this. The judge told her that he understands where she's coming from, but she can't make outbursts like that because it's not helping her son's case. And she said she wouldn't, and she didn't again after that. And at that point, they were just awaiting their trial. And obviously, Jimmy's testimony is going to be a huge part of this trial, really holding the whole thing together. And Jimmy was awarded immunity for his participation in the trial, but he would still face charges for the murder of his girlfriend. So to everyone's surprise and frustration, Shara took a plea deal. She pleaded guilty to the facilitation of first degree murder on July 25th, 2019, which is not common. You really don't hear the term facilitation of a murder very often. And this meant that she would never have to face a jury. Her giving this guilty plea would take the possibility of a life sentence right off the table. And instead, Shara was sentenced to 30 years in prison. I do find this um, right that there is a factual basis. There is a reason for this change of plea, which has been entered freely and voluntarily. Upon your plea of guilty to indictment one seven, Zero five eight eight one count one facilitation of first degree murder class A felony as included in this indictment. This right it is the judgment of this court that you are guilty. 
This court sets your punishment at 30 years confinement in the Tennessee Department of Correction. And Shara Wright has a guilty plea. She pleaded guilty to facilitation of first-degree murder and attempted facilitation of first-degree murder. She was sentenced as part of that guilty plea to 30 years in prison. She will be eligible for parole in about eight or nine years, and she will be given credit for the roughly two years she has already served since being arrested in December 2017. And people were very very angry. Many felt like it just wasn't fair that Lorenzen had lost his life and she was only going to get 30 years. Now, Billy did not follow in the footsteps of Shara. Instead, he pleaded not guilty to the charges of first degree murder, conspiracy to commit first degree murder, and attempted first degree murder. So his trial was supposed to happen back in 2021. The pandemic delayed that. And so this took place in March of 2022. And one thing that would be very important for the prosecuting attorney to do is establish some kind of motive as to why Shara and therefore Billy would want Lorenzen dead. And money was believed to be a major factor here, but not money in the sense that Lorenzen owed someone. When his body was found, he was still wearing expensive jewelry. If his killers were after something like drug money, taking these items would have you know, been a given. The financial motive in this case was the $1 million life insurance policy, basically that he was worth more to them dead than he was alive. And on top of a financial motive, testimony from another one of Shara's cousins named Claudia mentioned that Shara believed her husband actually had a hit out on her. Now, we don't know if that's actually true, but that was part of the testimony that Shara believed that her husband was going to kill her. I was in the kitchen preparing lunch uh, for the children and Shara really entered the kitchen and Shara was just irate saying Lorenzen had a hit on her. She had been told that he had a hit on her. Like a hit like the killer? Yes, sir. How many times did she say that? Um, often she repeats what she said. So she just kind of repeatedly said it. He has a hit on me. I can't believe he has a hit on me. He has a hit on me. And what did she say she was going to do about it? Um, well, Billy was standing there and was just like, okay, Cheryl, like what? And she said, um, it's him or me. Like, what do you mean? He has a hit on me. He has to be gone. And as you just heard, Claudia placed Billy at her home when Shara said, it's him or me. And she also said that this was not the first time that Shara and Billy were having these conversations with her around. And she said the only reason she didn't say something or try to stop them was because she didn't believe that they could possibly be serious. But of all the testimony, like I said, Jimmy's really was most important. Jimmy explained that in spring of 2010, Shara reached out to him about her plot to kill her ex-husband. And he says that he told her that this wasn't the type of business she wanted to get in, but still sat and listened as Shara and Billy began to brainstorm. All right, so that's not the business you want to be in. What happens after you tell her that? After that, it's get into a brainstorming session on, well, if we do do this, how, how best to do it. And is this at the house? This is at the house. There was a follow-up meeting between the three of them where Jimmy says that the three of them began talking about the type of equipment that they would need. Even though he says he was involved in the planning stages, he didn't think that it would ever really pan out. But in June of 2010, Jimmy was driving to his hometown of Batesville, Mississippi, when Shara called him and told him to look in the trunk when he arrived. And when he looked, Shara had placed three guns in there, some weed and cash. And she called him back to tell him to head to Atlanta where Lorenzen should be and go through with the shooting. Okay, I get a call from Shara. It tell me to, uh, asking me to head to Atlanta and it, uh, Lorenzen should be at his condo. Did y'all talk about what exactly you were gonna do when you get there or anything like that? Yeah, it was, uh, basically kiss the, the resin in a compromised position and, and, and take care of him. And Jimmy told Shara that he had tried and that Lorenzen wasn't home, but the truth was he didn't even go there. And did you go to Atlanta that same day? Uh, no, sir. Did you go to Atlanta that next day? No, sir. Well, tell us what you did. Man, I just stayed down. <laughs> did you tell her you went to Atlanta? Yeah, I told her when, when she called. I said I went to Atlanta and didn't find her. Did she like that? No, she got upset. You think she believed you that she even went? No, she didn't believe. 
Yeah, you were being a bit of a con man. Yeah, I was. After all, she had given him money and weed. Well, now you're in Baseville. You got three guns and some money. You say some marijuana too? Marijuana. What do you do? Yeah. I got money and weed. I'm good. You got money and weed and you felt that like you're good. Yeah. What'd you do with the three guns? I ain't got rid of them. But like we heard, Shara was unhappy that Jimmy was unable to get the job done. Even if she didn't believe him the first time, her second plan included Billy. And by Jimmy's account, he was on board to go through with it. So when Shara called Jimmy to say that Billy would be going with him this time, she explained that she had recently gone to Lorenzen's Atlanta condo and left a window unlocked. And she said that they should go in and out of this window when they did go to kill him. But that attempt was unsuccessful as well because after they snuck in, there was an unknown person sleeping on the couch. We uh, went through the like, little side area, through a couple of buildings, and when we got to his uh, condominium, it was a window unlocked. When we, when we get it, it's like a game room. What do you mean by game room? Like a pool table, PlayStation. Do you remember there being a pool table in the room? Yes, sir. Do you remember what color it was? It was red. Do you remember anything else that was uh, in the room? Yeah, it was a PlayStation, lounge seats, TV. So, like you said, playroom game or no game? Was anybody in that room? No, sir. Did y'all leave the condo? Uh, promptly after we realized there wasn't nobody there. Promptly yeah, after you? Yeah, probably after we seen it was somebody else there other than the reason. We left. How'd y'all leave? It was the same way we came. So after this second unsuccessful attempt, Shara kind of took things into her own hands. During the July 19th shooting of Lorenzen, Jimmy was in his hometown of Batesville. But like I mentioned, he was called up by Shara to come and help her with the cleanup. Jimmy said that Shara took him and Billy back to the field and explained what happened. And she lured him there by telling him that they were gonna be getting money from someone. And when they got there, Billy was already there. She said, and she told uh, Lorenzen that she was going to meet somebody for some money. That's when she met up with Billy, I guess on his uh, abandoned rural road. And I guess Lorenzen pretty quickly figured out what was happening and tried to run away. He managed to jump over a barbed wire fence, but eventually they caught up to him and began to shoot him. Her and Lorenz met up with Billy on this road. That's when I guess they ambushed him. You say you guess, why do you say you guess? Because I wasn't there. Did she tell you what happened once they met up with him other than Lorenzo jumping over the fence. She met up with him. She said, I mean, she said a lot of things, but just in memory is that Lorenzo had his back to him. They started chasing him. They started firing at him, chasing him. He jumped through the fence. He was jumping like a deer. They caught him when he fell. Did she say whether or not she had a gun? Yes, sir. Did she say whether or not Billy had a gun? Yes, sir. She said both of them had a gun. She said whether or not both of them fired. She said both of them fired. And according to Jimmy, they actually lost one of the guns at the scene. And so they had Jimmy bring a metal detector when he came to clean up the scene to try and look for it. And it was that call when they asked him to bring the metal detector that he found out that Shara's plan had worked and Lorenzen was dead. Once y'all get to this rural area, what do y'all do? Get to, uh, to an area where there's a a field, you can see a field in the distance, and it's a fence that's going across like a barbed wire fence. Barbed wire fence, okay. Sheriff sure, is basically explaining to you, like, yeah, we jump the fence, we don't want to leave anything behind, so we're going to cut, we're going to cut the fence. So after they cut out approximately six to eight feet of the fence and used the metal detector to look for the gun for 30 minutes, Jimmy left and he wasn't contacted after that for several days. When he was contacted again, it was for the purpose of helping Billy get rid of one of the guns. And it's still unclear to this day what actually happened to the other weapon. Jimmy then says that the two of them, he and Billy, drove to the lake. They scratched the serial number off the gun 
and then they threw it into the water. Did they get the pills out the uh, trunk, fouled off the cereal on it, and threw it into the lake? And where were you when this was happening? I was uh, right there beside. And his testimony was proven to be credible because it was his tip that led the FBI to the lake where they actually found the gun. The key was uh, the gun. We knew that if we found that gun, then that would corroborate what Jimmy Martin was telling us. So after almost a week of testimony, the jury deliberated, and it only took them three hours to determine that Billy was guilty. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of first-degree murder. It's charged in count one of the indictment. Count two, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. It's charged in count two of the indictment. Count three, criminal attempt first-degree murder. The verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of criminal attempt first-degree murder as charged in count three of the indictment. And Billy Ray Turner was sentenced to life in prison. Now, even though both of Lorenzen's killers had been found guilty, of course, Lorenzen's family was not happy with Shara's sentence. I mean, 30 years feels like a slap on the wrist considering she was the mastermind behind the murder and she had ordered several hits on him. After Shara was sentenced, Deborah did get to make a statement to her. And surprisingly, she went somewhat easy on her. Um, it was surprising to a lot of people, but she really focused on how she wanted to have a relationship with the kids going forward and basically begged her to not fill their heads with anything, to make sure that they know their grandmother loves them. And the twins are going to be playing basketball near us now, so we want to see them too. We want them to be talking. Let them know we didn't do anything to them. We didn't lie to them or anything. We just love them. We just want to see them. That's all. I want you to get the kids and let them know we didn't do anything to them. We love them. We want to see them. But the Wright family is you know, trying to move on, trying to do everything they can to get back on their feet and keep their family together. Man, it's just a lot, uh, the process, a lot going on. Uh, I don't know, I'm still processing it all and still trying to take it all in. So Shara is set to face her 30 year sentence at the Deborah K. Johnson Rehabilitation Center. Although recently in May of 2022, she was given a parole hearing and she was given this early parole hearing based on her safety value, which is the earliest possible release date for certain inmates. Due to prison overcrowding, certain inmates are awarded hearings earlier than others. And Shara was one of those inmates. She told the parole board that based on her behavior and her performance in certain classes that she's been taking, that she's a strong candidate for early release. She also noted that she has a strong support system waiting for her on the outside. And two out of six of her kids actually spoke in favor of her early release. And of course, Lorenzen's family also spoke against her early release. Thankfully, in my opinion, Shara's early release was denied, and her next hearing is not until May of 2027. This morning, the parole board announced that she'll serve at least five more years before they'll consider setting her free again. And no one was happier to hear the decision than Lorenzen's mother, Deborah Marion. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody hearing my cry. Yes, I'm glad because, you know, I'm doing life, so she facilitated so she can do her 30 for what she did. So hopefully she will at least serve those 30 years, but... Who knows? I personally feel that the sentence was very unfair. I really feel for the Wright family, for both of his parents. It's a very frustrating outcome and frustrating case overall, especially the fact that that 911 call was not reported. I just cannot imagine working in dispatch and not reporting something like that. Even if it wasn't in your jurisdiction or whatever excuse they gave, why would you not say anything to anyone about that? Just blows my mind. But anyway, of course, I want to hear your thoughts on this one, guys. So let me know in the comments below. And before I go, I would like to thank today's sponsor, which is Way. 
So this is actually the second video of mine that Way has sponsored, and I'm really glad they came back to sponsor a second video because I am a huge fan of Way products in general, but especially their scalp serum. Guys, we just don't realize how important scalp health is and how rough we can be on our scalp. Way's scalp serum balances, hydrates, and soothes irritation, creating an ideal environment for hair to thrive. And it really does help support the appearance of thicker, healthier hair. Plus what's great is it's vegan, cruelty-free, gluten-free, it has hyaluronic acid for hydration and a healthy barrier, red clover flower extract to reduce scalp discomfort, and peptides for the appearance of fuller, thicker, healthier hair. It's also safe for color-treated and chemical-treated hair. You guys, the way to healthy hair really does start with the scalp. So shop Way's all-new scalp serum by going to T H E O U A I com and use code Kendall to get 15% off your entire purchase. That's 15% off your entire order at the way.com, which is T H E O U A I.com with code Kendall. And that is it for me this week. You guys, I actually will be off next week again to pre-record for maternity leave. And hopefully I will be back the week after that, but <laughs> Who knows at this point, everything's really up in the air. We'll have to let baby decide that one. Thank you all for watching. I will see you soon, but until then, stay safe out there. Mm -hmm.